What is the law that Clarence Thomas is now apparently in violation of? The law, Lawrence, is 28 U.S. Code, Section 455. It contains two provisions that almost any lawyer would say require Clarence Thomas not to participate at all. One of them says that a justice, and it specifically applies to Supreme Court justices, may not participate if somebody could reasonably question that justice's impartiality. Clearly, that's the case here. Another section says that if a justice's spouse has an interest in a case, the justice must not participate. It's obvious that Ginny Thomas has an interest. She was an active participant in the attempt to use something like the independent state legislature theory that was before the court on the argument on Wednesday, and Clarence Thomas happily participated anyway. And he was a very active participant. In fact, some of his questions were particularly pointed. He tried to trap the defenders of a democratic approach to this, the opponents of the independent state legislature theory, by saying, do you think that you would still be arguing this if the state legislature had drawn lines that were too favorable for racial minorities instead of the other way around. And if the highest court of North Carolina had said that violates an anti-affirmative action provision of our Constitution, he obviously thought he had trapped somebody. He didn't succeed. But by trying to show that it's a question of whose ox is gored, he shined or shone, whatever the word is, a spotlight on his own lack of disinterest in this matter. The trouble is that that statute and anything else anyone has come up with cannot be enforced directly. The chief justice can't enforce it. It's very unlikely that the Justice Department could enforce it. So what do we do? I think what we do is we focus on the people who are outside the justices' chambers, who are exerting improper influence. Perhaps justices' friends, families, others should be under an obligation to report all of their outside sources of income and influence. The reverend who testified before the House Judiciary Committee just this morning uh, and who said basically, you know, under oath, Clarence Thomas told me that our lobbying was really paying off, having an influence. Well, that just means that anyone who meets with a justice should be under an obligation enforceable by criminal law, at least to report every such meeting. So those who wine and dine Justice Alito or Justice Thomas in the increasingly exposed miasma that surrounds the court, they're the ones that we could enforce the law against. I haven't tried to work up a statute, but that's where I think Congress has to focus its attention, not just, you know, passing yet another ethics code, which can be ignored by a justice who, like Thomas, would simply thumb his nose at it. Uh, I, I just want to go over the unenforceability uh, a bit for the audience, because I know people think that all laws, uh, I think, I think they assume that all laws have uh, penalties for noncompliance with right. laws. But in fact, a tremendous amount of the law that we write does not contain a penalty. It's, it's in effect, it would be like writing a speed limit that just says the speed limit is 65 miles an hour. In fact, what we do is we write a speed limit that says it's 65 miles an hour and you are finable by X amount or arrestable and, and it spells out all the penalties that you, can in, that you can incur by breaking that speed limit. But there are pages and pages and pages of law, federal and state, that don't have penalties attached to them, criminal penalties, and that's what makes enforceability a challenge. Exactly, and 28 U.S. Code Section 455 is one of them. It says it shall be unlawful for a justice to do what it seems that Clarence Thomas, as a Supreme Court justice, has done. People who think that these rules don't apply to justices are wrong. They, they apply. That law applies. It uses the word justice. And the only judges in the federal system who are justices are the nine that we 
see all the time uh, sitting in the marble palace. They are subject to the law, but the law is not enforceable. And it's not going to be easy to figure out how best to enforce it. But I think focusing on the people who surround the justices and how, sort of prop them up and encourage them to ignore precedent, to bring their own ideology to bear rather than trying to be fair arbiters of the law, those are the people that perhaps we should go after. You know, I have no doubt. I mean, I, I used to be uh, specializing in writing tax law in the Senate, and I would always say, what's the uh, what's the penalty for this? If you don't, what's the price? What's the penalty? And we there were once in a great while in tax law, there isn't one, but that's mostly tax law has a penalty for noncompliance. I am sure that when the Judiciary Committee was writing this law about judges, someone in the corner might have said, how do we enforce it? What's the enforceability? And I'm sure the consensus was, you don't need that. No Supreme Court justice would ever dare take on the public image of violating a law like this. Well, if that's what they thought, they were being pretty naive. You know, mm -hmm. in the tax context that you were very much involved in, although there are penalties, it's really the reluctance of people to violate the law that accounts for a mm -hmm. lot of its compliance. People stop at stop signs, they don't run red lights, even if there aren't cops around, even if only a tiny percent of people are audited, the compliance rate is pretty high. And you would think that at the apex of the judicial system, the ethical constraints would be self-enforcing, but it turns out they're not. I think the ultimate solution is to have better justices and not to select the kinds of people that on occasion we've put on the court. Carson Swalwell, uh, this sounds like a prosecution tactic by uh, Jack Smith, the special prosecutor, in order to get an, a claim on the record one way or the other, uh, do, in effect, to Donald Trump. Do you have any more documents? Uh, and in a normal criminal investigation, you wouldn't be able to ask Donald Trump, if he's the target of your investigation, you wouldn't be able to ask him any questions uh, directly. You just have to uh, do your best at the investigation. Uh, but this seems to be a way in, uh, a kind of a side door in, to get a statement one way or the other from Donald Trump about what documents might remain in his possession. And if his answer is not true, uh, that can add weight uh, to the prosecution's uh, investigation. On the other hand, a true answer might also add weight to the uh, prosecution's case. Uh, Lawrence, Donald Trump is a legal terrorist, and, and so he has benefited for decades by delay, delay, delay. You know, this is a tactic that he's used, but the walls are closing in. And, and as you've just pointed out, uh, you know, there's really no right answer here uh, for Donald Trump. And, and his silence uh, is deafening. It's essentially an admission that he still possesses these documents, which gives reason for the DOJ to, you know, proceed with this case. I also, again, just, just stepping back, like, why do they care so much? The guy has priors, you know. He, in the past, do you think that a man who was willing to leverage $350 million of taxpayer dollars to get dirt on his opponent through the Ukrainians wouldn't be willing to use documents that he stole to benefit himself? So they have every reason to want these documents, knowing who Donald Trump is, what could be in the documents. And again, I, I think we're approaching a legal crescendo for Donald Trump that he has not seen uh, in the years that he's been in the courts. You are a hero to every Democrat working in the Senate who desperately needed you to succeed, uh, to deliver a real majority to the Senate. What was the key to the campaign from your strategic standpoint? Well, thank you for having me on tonight, Lawrence. I, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, our strategy was simple. I, I think we knew we needed to make this race uh, about two individuals. Uh, and given the choice of who Georgians wanted to represent their families, uh, they had to pick between uh, the reverend uh, or the running back. Uh, we set out to do that from the very beginning. We were clear uh, about where we needed to go in the state to do that, who we needed to talk to in the state to do that. Uh, and I'm very pleased with the result. Um, I actually think when we pivoted to the runoff election, uh, our team did a lot of work to prepare. Uh, we knew that a runoff was a possibility, even though we wanted to win outright in November. Uh, and we put in the work. 
Uh, we knew what we needed to do in the early vote period uh, to bank the votes that we needed to do uh, to have in the bank before Election Day. Uh, we were successful in doing that. And so I think it's discipline uh, and knowing who we needed to talk to and what we were trying to say to those voters in the state of Georgia. Uh, you have a, a great deal of experience uh, in campaigns, but uh, but now uh, Senator Warnock has had to run uh, a couple of them uh, very quickly, uh, back to back, uh, two, two years apart. So he's now one of the more experienced campaigners uh, in the United States Senate. Uh, how did you, you were, you were dealing with someone who didn't have decades of experience as a candidate uh, working his way up from lower elected offices. Uh, what what do you think the effect of that was in the campaign? Well, you, you often hear Senator Warnock say that uh, you can't represent the people uh, if you don't know the people. Uh, and that was clear from the work that we put in. So you guys heard me say that one of our strategic goals was to keep Warnock and 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 keep Senator Warnock remaining the reverend. Uh, part of that is is making Georgia feel like they're a piece of his congregation. Uh, this is somebody who's been doing the work for years, a uh, senior pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, uh, who's been arrested, uh, fighting for civil rights, uh, who's been an activist in the community, is standing alongside them. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, when the senator voted during the runoff, he's standing in line with the people. Uh, we weren't skipping to the front of the line. Uh, it's that experience that I think ties Senator Warnock, and you guys heard in the opening uh, of his speech, it makes Senator Warnock a Georgian. He is from Georgia. He is a part of Georgia, a son of Georgia. And at the end of the day, Georgia voters saw that uh, and elected him to represent their families for a full term. The first time I saw a Warnock uh, campaign ad, which was during his first Senate campaign, it was one of those TV ads where I went, wait, I had to turn and, you know, re well, let me watch that, rewind it. It was really, really compelling, really grabbed you and was very creative, innovative. I want to go to one uh, that you closed the campaign with. Let's take a look at this one. The other night I was watching this movie. I was watching this movie called Fright Night, Freak Night, or some type of night. But it was about vampires. I don't know if you know vampires are cool people. What the hell is he talking about? <laughs> is he serious? Is he for real? But I'm gonna tell you something that I found out. A werewolf can kill a vampire. Did you know that? What is he talking about? I never about? knew that, so I didn't want to be a vampire anymore. I wanted to be a werewolf. Oh, my gosh. He's talking about vampires and werewolves right now. Yeah, y'all serious about this, right? That's the way you closed the TV ad campaign. But all the way through, even before it got to the vampire stage, uh, the Warnock ads have, and before when he wasn't running against a Herschel Walker, uh, the Warnock TV ads have really been special. How, who, who's the team putting those together? Oh, well, first and foremost, you, you have Senator Warnock, uh, who, who is willing to step outside the box to deliver messages to people in ways that they would understand. Uh, Adam Magnus. Uh, does our television. Uh, he creates great ads. Uh, and in a state like Georgia, particularly in a cycle like this, uh, when Governor Kemp was on television, Stacey Abrams was on television, our campaign, every outside organization was on television. You have to do something to break through the clutter. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud of the ads that we were able to put together uh, to do that. Uh, this ad in particular was an ad that we pivoted to during the runoff because going into the runoff, we felt that we had litigated the case against Herschel Walker. Georgians knew who Herschel Walker was. And I think that the only thing left uh, was for Georgians to ask themselves, would they be embarrassed uh, if Senator Warnock or, or if Herschel Walker uh, was their senator? Uh, and the best way to do that was to get real Georgians reacting to Herschel Walker's own words, which we did throughout the campaign, um, which I think was effective in you know, establishing his credibility um, as, as an elected official. And I think we were successful in doing that. And this ad in particular, I think, really carried the load for us during the runoff uh, and got us where we wanted to be. So how was it for you in those final days where I can tell you everyone I knew who had a hope for your campaign to win was desperately nervous on the verge of panic every day for uh, at least a week before Election Day? What was your mix of confidence and worry as you approached uh, the night of vote counting in Georgia? You know, I was confident. Um, I was confident because we had put in the work. Um, you know, I, I think any campaign manager or anybody that works in campaigns that tells you they they 100 percent know that they're going to win in a state like Georgia is being a bit facetious. Uh, but we had put in the work. And part of that was doing what we needed to do to turn Georgians out to vote, uh, fighting uh, for Georgia voters to have the right to vote. Uh, we, we took the state to court and sued to get a day of Saturday voting, uh, which ultimately turned out to be one of the largest days of Saturday voting uh, in the history of Georgia. 
Uh, and, you know, from that, we carried momentum. I mean, this is actively, we were running against a party and a candidate who wanted to deny people the right to vote. Uh, and when that happens, you know, we were walking and chewing gum. We kept our reverend ads up, the positive ads that we were running about Senator Warnock. Uh, we kept our foot on the gas against Herschel Walker as the ad that we just saw. Uh, and at the same time, we were educating voters while we were about election dates that were moving. Uh, and so I'm really proud of the work. I'm really proud of the way Georgians first and foremost responded. I mean, I am incredibly proud of the campaign, uh, but Georgia should also get a lot of credit for this. We had people standing in line for two, three hours, uh, standing in the rain on election day to get this done. And, and that's exactly what they did. And so the credit should go to Georgians as well.